Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 87, Ptolemaic Egypt, The Great Revolt. The sun will darken, as it will not be willing to observe the evils in Egypt. The earth will not respond to seeds. These will be part of its blight. The farmer will be done for taxes for what he did not plant. There will be fighting in Egypt, because people will be in need of food. What one plants, another will reap and carry off. End quote. So begins the passage known as the Oracle of the Potter, a text written by an Egyptian author sometime during the 2nd century BC. Much like the contemporary biblical material written in Judea, the Oracle is a piece of apocalyptic literature retroactively predicting the struggles that gripped the Egyptians living under the rule of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Yet it also reveals that a great punishment would befall the so-called girdle-wearers, i.e. the Greeks, and a divine retribution for the native Egyptians that toiled under their yoke. This would be known as the Great Revolt, a widespread rebellion lasting from 206 to 186 that saw the establishment of a rival pharaoh in Thebes, much of Upper Egypt sundered from Ptolemaic control, and the dynasty itself would be left on the brink of extinction. When we last left the narrative in Egypt, Ptolemy IV Philopater and Arsinoe III Thea Philopater had triumphantly returned from their victory over Antiochus III at the Battle of Raphia in 217. This was a surprise to everyone, given Ptolemy's already poor reputation as a lazy and ineffectual king. But peace with the Seleucids was assured for the moment. Following the end of the Fourth Syrian War, the rest of Ptolemy's career is pretty unremarkable. Perhaps this is due in no small part to the lack of interest from the ancient historians like Polybius, who openly expressed his disgust for Philopater and refused to give a year-by-year -year assessment of the king's rule like he did with the more impressive Philip V of Macedon and Antiochus III of Syria. Still, there are bits and pieces to look at during this time before we discuss the breakout of the Great Revolt. No military expeditions would be conducted during the rest of his career, and involvement in the administration of his far-flung territories remain minimal. The ancient historians fixate quite heavily on Ptolemy's own personal vices and passion projects. One of his more ambitious endeavors was the building of the Tesseracontaries, probably the largest ship ever constructed in antiquity, requiring nearly 4,000 rowers just to move it. It had no practical value beyond its prestige factor, and would have cost an exorbitant amount of money to finance. He was also something of a literature aficionado, composing a play named Adonis, and sponsoring a temple dedicated to Homer. This does not mean that he did not keep a close eye on the affairs of the Mediterranean. Egypt was not directly involved with the great conflicts of the 210s and 200s, and the Ptolemaic government tried its best to either remain neutral or encourage peace for its own benefit. Agents were sent along with other city-states to broker the end of the social war that had been afflicting Greece from 220 to 217, and again with the First Macedonian War in 210. War wasn't always good for business, and the Egyptian government hoped to contain the ambitious Philip to Europe, lest he conquer the Greek peninsula outright and march against Ptolemaic holdings in Asia Minor. He was also courted by both sides of the Second Punic War, Embassies from the Roman Republic arrived in 210, looking to re-establish the friendship that was initially made with his grandfather, Ptolemy II, and also to buy grain after Hannibal's armies ravaged much of Italy. Hieronymus of Syracuse also sent a gift with his delegates in the form of an enormous ship to sway the king to Carthage's side, but Philopater does not seem to have been inclined to give them any sort of positive response either. While Ptolemy IV's career appears to have largely been quiet, if not downright unimpressive, his poor reputation likely was due to the declining competency of his government. Since taking the throne, the ancient authors accused Ptolemy of handing over the reins of governance to his ministers and personal friends, while he indulged himself with the perks of being king. The most prominent of these was Sosibius, who was admittedly instrumental in the reforms necessary to defend against Antiochus's invasion force, but his orchestration of the murders of prominent figures of the Egyptian court namely the Queen Mother Berenike II and the advisor Cleomenes of Sparta, among others, demonstrated the ruthlessness by which he sought to exert control over Ptolemy. Other prominent sycophants include the brother-sister duo of Agathocles and Agathocleia. 
both of which are suggested to have been bedroom companions of the king. They, along with their mother, Oenoanthi, turned the court into a circus, dispensing positions and gifts to their friends with reckless abandon. Agathocles was an especially hated figure, and all agree that Ptolemy's ability to rule effectively was hampered by the cancer within his inner circle. Yet in 204, Ptolemy IV Philopater died at the age of 40, survived by his wife Arsinoe and his young son Ptolemy, who was no more than six years old. There are no rumors of foul play, but the kingdom was now in a dangerously compromised position with a child being the sole heir to the throne of Egypt. Like the former queen mother Berenike II, Arsinoe could have been a strong maternal figure to protect the interests of her son from the machinations of the court. In one anecdote, the geographer Eratosthenes claims that Arsinoe publicly scolded her husband on the grounds that the gluttonous festival he tried to introduce was unbecoming of their status, suggesting that she was at least capable of some degree of competency. Unfortunately, like Berenike, Sosibius had once again taken the initiative. The king's death was kept a secret for many days, but before Arsinoe could make a public statement, Sosibius dispatched an assassin and had her murdered, leaving the young Ptolemy an orphan and fully within his grasp. A few days after Arsinoe's murder, an assembly of the leading officials and army officers was organized. Sosibius and Agathocles spoke to the group, announcing the death of Ptolemy and Arsinoe, and crowned the young prince as King Ptolemy V. They also presented a forged will which designated both men as the boy king's guardians, effectively making them the masters of Egypt. A murmur of discontent spread throughout the crowd. Nobody was really surprised, or cared for that matter, that Ptolemy IV died. For the queen to perish at the same time without explanation only raised everyone's suspicions, and the thought that power was now being handed over to the hate of the Gathicles caused deep resentment. The ministers realized that their ruse was not working as smoothly as they hoped, so they immediately bribed the royal guards with two months of pay and demanded an oath of loyalty. When the goodwill of the army appeared secure, the pair sent away most of the members of the Alexandrian court in order to replace them with men from Agathocles' circle of friends. Sosibius seems to have died shortly after the coronation, presumably of old age, but with no real check on his authority, the court became Agathocles' playhouse of debauchery and drinking, much to the ire of everyone else. The outrage was such that the Alexandrian elite began to place their hopes on a man named Telepolemus, the governor of Pelusium, to act as their representative. Open mockery of the minister at dinner parties led to accusations of treason being thrown between both men. In one pathetic display, Agathocles gave a speech in front of the army demanding their support against Teleopolemus, complete with crocodile tears and the use of Ptolemy V as a prop for emotional blackmail. No one bought it. He soon escalated the situation to a boiling point by ordering the arrest of several prominent figures, including Teleopolemus' mother, which enraged the Alexandrian populace. In the course of one night in 203, both the soldiers and citizens of Alexandria were assembling en masse, armed with torches and weapons in hand, with loud chants of, Bring the King, echoing throughout the city. The rioting started when they broke into the palace quarters and surrounded the building that held Ptolemy inside. Along with him were Agathocles and Agathocleia, who piteously begged for mercy after they handed over the boy king to the crowd outside. Surprisingly, Ptolemy remained unharmed, having been brought to the royal viewing box of the Hippodrome and acknowledged as the king by the Alexandrians. Agathocles and his family were not so lucky. With the young pharaoh's complicit nod, the blood-hungry populace set themselves upon the former minister's household, dragging Agathocles in chains to the stadium and stabbed him to death. He got off easy. Agathocleia and their mother, Oenanthi, were also brought to the stadium, stripped naked in front of everyone, and were quite literally torn limb from limb by the crowd. Though the court had rid itself of its most malignant elements in a horrifically grisly fashion, there was still the matter of governance, for Ptolemy was still too young to rule on his own. Teleopolemus was made chief minister, and it would be left to him to try and guide the boy king. So ended the reign of Ptolemy IV and his ministers, a disastrous harbinger for the violent court politics that would have ravaged the dynasty down to its final days. 
While the chaotic political situation at Alexandria and the culling of the House of Ptolemy were bad enough, this was not the only major crisis gripping Egypt, for a province-wide rebellion had spread throughout the south that threatened to topple the already vulnerable kingdom. Hey everyone, please spare me a few moments for this brief announcement. I have had the honor of being named an Outreach Ambassador for Save Ancient Studies Alliance, or SASA for short, which is dedicated to improving awareness and accessibility of ancient studies, particularly within post-secondary education. From July 23rd through July 24th, 2023, SASA will be hosting a virtual conference based on the theme of science and technology in the ancient world, which is entirely free to the public. Several guest speakers will be presenting on topics relevant to the Hellenistic period, and I myself will be taking part in a workshop with other panelists on the 23rd to discuss my own experience in public outreach for ancient history. Links to both the conference and SASA's website will be in the episode description and I hope you consider joining us. Now, back to our regularly scheduled program. During the final years of Ptolemy IV's reign, outbreaks of violence were being reported throughout the countryside, especially in the south. Soon afterwards, the city of Thebes was seized from Ptolemaic control by a rebel Egyptian leader, Haranophorus, who declared himself pharaoh. Much of Upper Egypt was torn away, an insurgent warfare would plague the land for nearly 20 years before it was finally put down at great cost. The Great Revolt, as it is generally known, is certainly not the first, nor the last, rebellion of the native Egyptians against Greek rule, but it is certainly the longest and most destructive. In comparison to the later Maccabean Revolt that affected Seleucid Judea, our knowledge on the Great Revolt is extremely poor. Polybius only alludes to it in the briefest of descriptions, considering it unfit for his histories, and not worth serious attention. Quote, Late in his reign, Ptolemy IV was forced by circumstances into the war I have mentioned, a war which, apart from the mutual savagery and lawlessness of the combatants, contained nothing worthy of note, no pitch battle, no sea fight, no siege. End quote. This is an interesting dismissal from someone who so readily documented the violent mercenary war that nearly destroyed Carthage, but perhaps it is because the revolt was so unsuited for Greek historiography that it indicates the level of anarchy. Most of our sources come from a small grouping of papyrus fragments and inscriptions numbering around 20 to 30 documents in total, but the most famous of these will be the Rosetta Stone, erected in 196. We do have a definitive beginning and end date, but the specificity of these texts means that we can only give a rough approximation of the actual details. The first known instance of warfare occurred in roughly 206 in Edfu, Apollonopolis Magna, just 100 kilometers north of Thebes. It isn't clear if the attacks were from a large uprising or an organized band of raiders, but it was enough to halt the construction of the Temple of Horus, as explained by an inscription on its walls. Edfu is situated in the Thebaid, a region referring to the broader area of Middle to Upper Egypt surrounding the city of Thebes, modern Luxor, the former capital of its ancient dynasties, down to as far as the Aswan. Though the Ptolemies had imposed their authority over the area, as evidenced by their establishment of the city of Ptolemais to serve as the administrative center, Greek occupation remained minimal with much of the day-to-day -day operations being handled by the local Egyptian priesthoods and temples. It is clear enough, though, that severe unrest was developing in this area throughout the late 3rd century, and it didn't take long before it finally exploded. In 205, an army of native Egyptians launched a major attack that saw the capture of Thebes and the eviction of its Ptolemaic garrison. The rebel leader took the name Haranophorus, and was declared pharaoh by the city's priesthood of Amun during autumn of that year, reflected by a limestone tablet which is dated to his first regnal year. Evidence for the collapse of Ptolemaic authority in the area is clear, for there are no tax receipts dating after September 207 for either Ptolemy IV or Ptolemy V until the mid-180s. The government in Alexandria was faced with a serious problem. Periods of unrest among the native Egyptians was not unknown, but the establishment of a rival pharaoh was unprecedented, and a direct challenge to the authority of the Ptolemaic king. Greek documents repeatedly refer to the rebellion as tarachi, which means disorder or disturbance, 
and might be a way to downplay the legitimacy of the rebel cause, but the scale was far greater than they perhaps would like to admit. If there was an attempt to organize a counterattack against Thebes by Ptolemy IV, it does not seem to have taken place, and since he died shortly afterwards and left his court to corrupt ministers, the rebellion was allowed to spread unchecked. Meanwhile, Hieronophorus continued to extend his control in all directions over the next few years. A graffito indicates that he had reached as far as the city of Abydos by the year 201, some 170 kilometers northwest of Thebes. If we are to believe Ptolemaic reports, the rebels were attacking temples that collaborated with the Ptolemies, presumably to access the stores of wealth and supplies inside, in addition to sending a message. Hieronophorus replaced the local administration with members of his own staff in the subsequent weeks after his coronation, and it is very possible that he was beginning to collect taxes as well. Contemporary documents from the area, marriage contracts, land transfers, and other legal records, continued to be produced much as they had before, albeit with the authority of Hieronophorus, and with no Greek names on them. In effect, a new rival state was being created in the south, and in conjunction with his declaration as pharaoh, Hieronophorus seemed intent on claiming the entirety of Egypt and driving out the Ptolemies. By 199, there appears to be a change in regime, for the name of Hieronophorus is no longer on documents, and we now find the name of Kaonophorus as the new rebel pharaoh. Many scholars have classified them as two separate individuals, but other historians suggest that they are one and the same person. For instance, documents under Kaonophorus's reign continue to use the regnal years of Haranophorus, rather than starting fresh from year zero, as per Egyptian custom. Based on this and other arguments, I believe that Haranophorus Kaonophorus was a single ruler, and will treat him as such. With the rebellion in full swing by 201, let us pause our narrative and assess the many causes that led to the Great Revolt. The 3rd century has often been described as the golden age of the Ptolemaic dynasty, and for good reason. They were the richest men and women on earth, using the gifts of the Nile River and a well-developed taxation program to build up a massive amount of wealth that allowed them to manage an overseas empire. Ostentatious displays of their financial acumen was part of the royal propaganda, but by the time of Ptolemy IV, this golden veneer had worn thin revealing serious underlying issues in the structure of Hellenistic Egypt. There are significant economic factors that need to be considered. It may seem strange to suggest that the Ptolemaic state was suffering from any sort of fiscal crisis when Ptolemy IV was spending large amounts of money on benefactions and pet projects like the Tesserocontaries. Yet, it is clear that the kingdom was experiencing a period of economic depression of sorts at the time of the revolt. Though the Ptolemies could boast of an empire that stretched across the eastern Mediterranean and was supported by a well-staffed navy, this model of success was actually part of their own undoing. To maintain this fleet meant enormous expenditures. During times of war, the military could eat up up to 80% of the year's budget. Following the Third Syrian War, Ptolemy III Euergetes appears to have spent the period of 241 to 222 instituting a policy of demobilization and no campaigns were waged at this time either. The decline of the army was attributed by the ancient authors to the indolence of Ptolemy IV, but in some ways he was merely continuing the practice of his father. This backfired when Antiochus III launched his invasion of Koili Syria and kickstarted the Fourth Syrian War in 219, and the Alexandrian government had to scramble to build up its forces in time. This recruitment drive saw the assembly of nearly 80,000 troops at Raphia, all paid for at the crown's expense, and there are also references to bribes and promises of additional payment after the victory. Though Polybius speaks with scorn regarding Ptolemy IV's apparent meekness and refusal to oversee further military campaigns, it is possible that he was simply unable to do so. Raphi was something of a Pyrrhic victory, for although Ptolemy was able to keep his throne, it cost him dearly in the long run. The government quickly had to demobilize the troops once peace with Antiochus was struck, lest they suffer a complete collapse in budget and subsequent mutiny over lack of pay, which already began to happen. No taxes would have been collected from wealthy Koili Syria and the surrounding provinces from 219 to 217, further hampering the ability of the king to recoup his expenses. To combat this growing insolvency, 
A number of reforms to the taxation system were instituted in the decades following the war's conclusion. The consequences of this economic downturn are also detectable in the numismatic and papyrological record. During Philopater's reign, bronze coins, used for local circulation, were heavily debased and mass-produced, while the use of silver declined in comparison. This inflation may have impacted the price of goods like wheat, which had been rising dramatically in the face of issues of supply and demand. We may also consider environmental disturbances as a contributing factor to the unrest that gripped Egypt. The Nile River was the source of Egyptian agriculture for thousands of years before the arrival of Alexander, and the Ptolemies placed additional layers onto an already well-developed taxation program. Its consistent flooding was its boon, but should the inundation arrive too early or too late or not at all, farming communities were thrown in disarray. This is a well-documented phenomenon during the Roman period onwards. But was there anything we can find during the Ptolemaic period? During the early reign of Ptolemy III in the year 245, the Nile failed to flood. Thanks to Greco-Roman and Egyptian sources, we know that there was severe social unrest during this time, enough to compel Ptolemy to abandon his successful Mesopotamian campaign in the Third Syrian War, which lasted from 246 to 241. Papyrus fragments also indicate that at the time of the Great Revolt's outbreak in 206, there was a period of drought and famine that afflicted many of the farms. One parallel link between these events are volcanic eruptions. While a volcano spews its material into the atmosphere, the ash and various aerosols can cause a cooling effect that interferes with tropical monsoons. Since the Nile is fed mainly by the monsoon rainfall in the Ethiopian highlands, the cooling can cause a period of drought. By sampling ice cores from places like Antarctica, scientists have determined that there were volcanic eruptions in 247, 244, and again in 209, which all line up neatly with the periods of unrest during the 3rd century. Environmental catastrophes such as these can place severe pressure on communities and governments on their own terms, but when such systems were already exacerbated by underlying societal problems, namely poverty, then it could be the proverbial straw on the camel's back. One of these societal problems may be linked to an inherent aspect of Ptolemaic rule, the division between the Greek ruling class and the indigenous Egyptians. On a surface level, the Great Revolt appears like an uprising that pitted the oppressed Egyptians rebelling against their Hellenic overlords. Some go so far as to even describe the revolt as the budding of Egyptian nationalism. The truth is more complicated but there are many elements that indicates a building resentment against Ptolemaic rule that contributed to the outbreak of the rebellion. Though the Ptolemies tried very hard to integrate themselves in the traditional power structure of Egypt and ally with the local priesthoods in Memphis, the Egyptians never forgot that they were now ruled by Greeks. The royal capital of Alexandria is almost dismissively named in Egyptian sources as Rakotis, construction site and members of the dynasty were still referred to as Ionians after nearly three centuries. Tensions between the newly arrived Greeks and their Egyptian neighbors is a recurring theme in surviving petitions. Those who could achieve the legal status of Hellene would be given special privileges when it came to taxes and social services. It is unlikely that there were any sort of ethnic or racial hierarchy in place akin to more modern colonial empires, but clearly there was a cultural favoritism expressed by the Ptolemies, who maintained their control over a majority indigenous population with the large-scale settlement of a professional land-owning military group, staffed primarily with Greeks. One of the most heavily discussed factors for the Egyptian rebellion is brought up by Polybius. Though he neglects to provide us a complete account of the revolt, Polybius directly points to the Fourth Syrian War. To gather enough troops to combat Antiochus III's massive force, 20,000 native Egyptians were recruited by Ptolemy's ministers, and trained as members of the Pike Phalanx, which was an unprecedented phenomenon. Past scholars have used this passage to argue that the Egyptians were prevented from serving in the Ptolemaic military to any significant capacity, but there is plenty of evidence of their involvement in the army prior to Philopter's decision. It is important to recognize that while the Egyptians served various roles in the military, the Pike Phalanx, so dominant in Hellenistic military doctrine, was hitherto reserved for Greco-Macedonian settlers who formed the professional core of the army. They were paid better than the Egyptian soldiers, allotted larger tracts of farmland, and given special social privileges. 
Still, the Egyptian pikemen performed valiantly in defense of the kingdom, yet were expected to simply return home without being properly compensated for their involvement. Polybius states that, thanks to their increased confidence and sense of pride in the immediate aftermath of Raphia, a large number of these Egyptian troops staged a mutiny while in the Delta. Unfortunately, there are problems with this account, since the historian implies that this mutiny is directly tied to the outbreak of the Great Revolt, which he openly neglects to cover, some ten years later. His unclear association between the two doesn't hold up much to scrutiny, and is likely its own event tied more to the rapid demobilization and problems of payment following the Fourth Syrian War, rather than a national identity issue. The Raffia Decree, erected by the Memphite priests to celebrate the victory over Antiochus, speaks of some sort of treachery committed by Ptolemy's officers after Raffia, but doesn't name the Egyptians as the responsible party. However, it is unsurprising that the Great Revolt would find its footing in the Thebaid, which was the center of power for the dynasties of the Middle and New Kingdom, in comparison to the Greek-oriented Delta. The aims of Haranophorus's rebellion are not explicitly made clear, but the type of threat it posed to the Ptolemaic state from an ideological level is worth investigating. When we look at the Seleucid Empire, they frequently suffered from rebellions that saw the rise of local leaders seeking the title of king, such as the Euthydemids of Bactria or the Adelids of Pergamon, and pushed for the possibility of secession from the empire. Yet the Seleucids could negotiate with these rulers to work towards a mutual goal without inherently compromising the strength of their royal authority. The only true threat to their sovereignty could come from potential usurpers who possessed a blood claim to the throne, directly challenging the reigning Seleucid monarch, see the War of the Brothers. Such arrangements had no precedent in the Ptolemaic Kingdom, and the most notable incident of political fragmentation was from Magus of Carini, who formed his own breakaway state in Libya rather than seeking to overthrow Ptolemy II Philadelphus. By contrast, the rebellion and coronation of Haranophorus was not merely an attempt to secede, but a direct counterclaim against Ptolemaic royal authority. According to the cosmological framework of the Egyptians, there was only one pharaoh who could maintain the balance of the universe and uphold Ma'at. Ergo, he was positioning himself not just as a pharaoh, but THE pharaoh. The choice of royal titulature is also another way to emphasize his legitimacy. The names Haranophorus and Kaunophorus are Greek renditions of Horwenefer, Horus Anophorus, and Ankwenefer, Anophorus lives. Horus is the god most associated with the pharaohan life, while Anophorus is the epithet of Osiris, the god associated with the pharaohan death. Therefore, the rebel leader was broadcasting his relationship with the traditional pantheon, intending to dismiss the claims of the Ptolemies. Of the various sources we can rely on, one of the most fascinating is the so-called Oracle of the Potter. Though it comes down to us in Greek, the oracle was originally composed in Demotic Egyptian during the 2nd century BC, giving us a uniquely Egyptian view on Greco-Egyptian relations outside of priestly inscriptions. It can be generally classified as apocalyptic literature, whereby the subject matter focuses on prophetic or revelatory storytelling that is retroactively inserted on the figures of the past by way of a supernatural being, angels, gods, etc. This format is well known in the Jewish and Christian traditions, namely the Book of Daniel, but there are a few examples to come out of Egypt as well. The story is centered around the visit of a simple potter to the court of Amenophis, better known as Amenhotep, a name belonging to a number of famous pharaohs of the New Kingdom in the 2nd millennium BC. Divinely inspired, the potter recites the many tragedies that were to befall Egypt under the reign of the so-called girdle-wearers, or Typhonians. Quote, The river, since it will not have sufficient water, will flood, but only a little so that scorched will be the land, but unnaturally, for in the time of the Typhonians, people will say, Wretched Egypt, you have been maltreated by the terrible malefactors who have committed evil against you. End quote. The potter describes the various ills sweeping the land, such as the failure of the Nile to flood and the heavy burden of taxation placed upon the Egyptians by the Typhonians, as I relayed at the beginning of the episode. However, he then turns to the fate of these Typhonians. Quote, 
For these things will happen when the great god Hephaestus will desire to return to the city, and the girdle wearers will kill each other as they are Typhonians. Evil will be done, and he will pursue them on foot to the sea in wrath, and destroy many of them because they are impious. It continues. Then Agathos Daimon will abandon the city that had been founded, and enter Memphis, and the city of foreigners, which had been founded, will be deserted. This will happen at the end of the evils of the time, when there will come to Egypt a crowd of foreigners. The city of the girdle wearers will be abandoned like my kiln, because of the crimes which they committed against Egypt. The cult images, which had been transported there, will be brought back again to Egypt. And the city by the sea will be a refuge for fishermen because Agathos Daimon and Nephis will have gone to Memphis. So that passerby will say, All nurturing was this city in which every race of men settled. Then will Egypt flourish when the generous 55-year ruler appears, the king descended from Helios, the giver of good things, the one installed by the greatest Isis, so that the living will pray that the dead might arise to share the prosperity. Finally, the leaves will fall. End quote. And so, the story ends with the return of Egypt's prosperity and the replacement of the Typhonian pharaohs with a rightful Egyptian one. The potter eventually dies and is buried in the temple of Heliopolis by Amenophis, the prophecies preserved for time immemorial. Clarification on the story's details is needed given the circumstance. Girdle wearers is clearly a reference to the Greeks who settled in Egypt following Alexander's conquests, since the author describes them as foreigners, among other terms. He also mentions the city of Alexandria, which is described as separate from Egypt, its actual name being Alexandria by Egypt rather than a part of Egypt, and also Agathos Daimon, a sort of syncretized deity possessing the head and torso of a male god with the body of a serpent which was popular with the Alexandrian Greeks and a patron of the city. We can confidently date its composition to the mid-2nd century BC because it makes reference to contemporary events, such as the invasion of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the quote-unquote king of Syria. While this does place it outside of the Great Revolt, its importance comes from the sentiments expressed by the author regarding the resentment between Egyptians and Greeks at the time. After all, the story ends on a positive note when the Greeks flee from Egypt, but there is more to it. Though the droughts and famines are part of the apocalyptic imagery, the author explicitly connects the problematic conditions of Egypt's climate with the burdensome taxes placed upon its peoples by the Ptolemaic regime, and also cites it as a reason why violence broke out. Egypt's salvation comes only when the gods themselves, namely Hephaestus, the Egyptian Ptah, intervene and drive them out of the country. Typhonian is another name used to describe the Hellenes, a reference to the monstrous Typhon of Greek myth that was associated with the Egyptian god Set. In Egyptian mythology, Set was the deity of storms, foreigners, and chaos. He was also the murderer of Osiris, and attempted to usurp his crown before being defeated by Horus. Obviously, the notion that the Greeks were followers of Set does not really carry any positive connotations, and the worship of an evil god would naturally lead to the general disorder that necessitated divine intervention. As we recall, the name of Haranophorus Kaunophorus is directly connected with both Horus and Osiris, making this distinction even more apparent. A part of the restoration in the story was the seizure of images of the gods from Alexandria and return to Egypt and Memphis which is a recurring theme in pharaonic propaganda. Though we have seen evidence that the division between Greek and Egyptian must have been a problem that contributed to the outbreak of violence, how much did this resentment manifest in the actions of the revolt? It is hard to say that what can be classified as anti-Greek versus anti-established political authority. As stated earlier, the Thebaid lost much of its Ptolemaic administration for we find no documents dated to the reign of Ptolemy IV or V during the revolt in the area. Raids against Ptolemaic fortifications and farmland must have been common. And in one interesting example from 194, a band of rebels attacked a number of farmers working on crown land in Muchis. When the official Petaminos was sent to investigate, the local villagers, predominantly Egyptian, hesitated on giving the names of the assailants until they were long gone. In this case, the farmers would have been Egyptian, 
And so it seems that the rebels target collaborators with the enemy regime, rather than just the Greeks. We must also consider that the negotiation of local elites was not necessarily drawn on anti-Greek lines either. One of the rebels' earliest supporters was the priesthood of Amun, the patron god of Thebes. While Amun was honored by the Greeks in the syncretized form of Zeus Amon to some degree, the Ptolemaic dynasty lavished much attention and patronage on the priesthood of Ptah in Memphis, with many of the kings adopting the epithet, Beloved of Ptah. Meanwhile, Haranophorus Karanophorus was declared pharaoh by the priests of Amun, given the epithet Beloved of Amun, and contracts with the rebel leader's regnal years were approved by those same priests. Their decision to promote a rival pharaoh may be in part due to the difficult financial situation that this priesthood faced in the preceding years of the revolt. The reforms enacted by the crown saw a more direct oversight over the collection of the region's taxes, a role that was largely performed by the priests up to that point, which provided the temples the necessary finances to support their estates and functions. Not only did they lose an important source of income, but they also saw their autonomy being encroached upon by scrutinous officials. In comparison, many of the other priesthoods, above all the Memphites, remained loyal to Ptolemy. They suffered setbacks from the rebels as well, and the discovery of vandalized royal decrees often placed within these temples may be indicative of the political violence intent on spreading a message for anyone looking to support the Greek dynasty. Regarding the Great Revolt as a whole, we may walk away with differing interpretations, but let me offer mine. On the one hand, the sources seem to suggest a general frustration between the Greeks and the Egyptians living under Ptolemaic rule. A sort of peaceful coexistence probably formed the bulk of these interactions, but the differences in socioeconomic status and cultural attitudes did not aid the situation. The economic turmoil of Egypt during the late 3rd century was a consequence of the nature of Ptolemaic rule, whose position as an imperial state amongst highly bellicose competitors and as a Greek minority asserting their authority over a much larger indigenous population meant that they were going to have to dedicate an enormous amount of money on military expenditures. To meet the fiscal demands of empire, the crown had to tax heavily or debase its currency. This was going to place pressure on the Egyptian population that, by virtue of their lower socioeconomic position, were going to notice it a lot earlier and longer. And when combined with an environmental catastrophe that results in famine, the stress can become too much to bear before the system ultimately collapses as these peoples lash out. Not all Egyptians participated, but Harunophorus was able to leverage this resentment against Ptolemaic authority and draw comparisons to the glory of past dynasties, catering to local elites who could support his cause and attacking those who didn't. With the near destruction of the Ptolemaic dynasty leaving only a boy king on the throne and a massive revolt of Egyptian subjects propping up a rival pharaoh, things were spiraling out of control. To make things even worse, this news was made well aware to the rest of the Mediterranean. In Syria, Antiochus III had returned from his decade-long anabasis at the head of his reunified empire and seasoned military force ready to begin yet another round of fighting over control of Koili Syria. Philip V of Macedon had also freed himself from his wars in Greece, and looked to the east in pursuit of a world empire. Like wolves circling a wounded deer, Antiochus and Philip joined forces to bring the full might of their armies upon the weakened Ptolemaic foe. The tripartite division that defined the Hellenistic world for a century looked to be coming to an end leaving only behind the Seleucids and Antigonids to share the spoils. Yet little did they know that the Ptolemies had one last trick up their sleeve and would call upon an unlikely ally to save the day, the Roman Republic.